Okay, let's talk about the effect of temperature on rate. We're going to talk about the Arrhenius equation, which is here in front of us. And then we're also going to talk about collision theory. Um, a lot of conceptual stuff in the last couple bits of this uh, chapter. And so we're going to do our best to see these um, in our um, real life applications and our reactions and things like that. Changing the temperature changes the rate constant of the rate law, okay? So that is how temperature is actually going to affect us. It will directly affect the rate constant, all right? So when we're looking at K here, this is the rate constant that we saw in all reactions. Now, uh, how does it affect? Well, as temperature increases, uh, typically what we see is that K will uh, increase. And so the rate will effectively increase. Now, T has to be in Kelvins, all right? R is the gas constant, but with energy units. Now, typically we had seen uh, R is equal to 0 0.0821. This was in um, ATM, liters over moles Kelvin, right? So what we've done is effectively multiplied it by 101.3 joules per ATM liter, right? So that we get an R that we will use for this equation as 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, we need to use joules because we are uh, trying to convert uh, with activation energy. E a up here, the negative E A is uh, very important. And that's what makes this reaction or makes this equation very specific to the reactions. E A is the activation energy. It's the energy needed to get the molecule starting to react. We'll see on a reaction coordinate diagram in just a second what activation energy actually is. Um, and A is called the frequency factor. Um, it's a constant uh, for each individual reaction, and it is looking at um, the reactant energy as it approaches activation energy, okay? A couple of things will be dependent on that frequency factor. All right, so here's our reaction coordinate diagram. Uh, this reaction is really, really important. It's one of the, um, the reactions that's still being studied today. Uh, H2 and O2 react um, to form H2O. This is how hydrogen fuel cells work. This is why hydrogen fuel cell cars are so important to us um, because the exhaust would be water vapor. Um, if you've ever seen a hydrogen fuel cell car, it does have a tailpipe. It does have an exhaust valve there. Um, however, you might see water dripping from it even on a normal Orange County day um, or wherever you live, you might still see, no matter what the temperature is, dripping coming off of that tailpipe. And you're like, what the heck is happening? It's because the exhaust is not carbon dioxide. Um, we are uh, combusting hydrogen gas in that uh, hydrogen fuel cell and therefore water vapor is released. Very, very cool reaction in my opinion. Um, really a game changer when we start to think about greenhouse gases and uh, trying to mitigate our carbon footprint. Now, reactants to products. Remember, reactants um, compared to products is thermodynamics. We just came from a whole bunch of thermodynamics. Now, in this chapter, we're going to compare reactants to the transition state. Reactants versus reactants versus the transition state, that little double slash um, kind of cross looking thing is called a transition state. That is kinetics. Remember, it's everything that happens in between. We ignored it in first unit and second unit. Now we're, we're diving right into it in this unit. Everything kinetics is right here in this reaction. Now, the amount of energy it takes to go from reactants to the transition state is called the activation energy. The higher the activation energy typically means the slower the reaction. Why? It's because the transition state is when we think about activated complexes, when we think about um, the middle part, when the actual bonds are breaking and forming, 
right? And we'll talk about this in class with more specific reactions. Um, that activation energy is not a reactant or a product. It's not isolatable, um, but it is a high energy transition state. So almost all reactions have some sort of an energy barrier. Some are very, very high. Some are very, very small. The activation energy is the amount of energy needed to convert reactants to that activated complex, also called the transition state, abbreviated double slash. That activated compact complex in a chemical species with partially broken, partially formed bonds. It's always very high in energy because of that partial bond nature. So if we think about isomerization of methyl isonitrile, okay, so methyl isonitrile can go from the nitrogen bonded to the carbon, And it can convert to the carbon bonded to the carbon. All right. Now this transition um, is exothermic because what we see is the reactant um, has a positive charge on the nitrogen and a negative charge on the carbon. That doesn't look as stable as the other way around when uh, the product is neutral. All right. But uh, notice that to get that rotation, to get that actual rotation, what we have to think about is these electrons need to start making a bond with that carbon, and these electrons need to move over to the nitrogen, right? That's how we get this new pair of electrons. And this pair of electron disappears. Now I'm using something called curved arrow notation. I'm going to use that for us just so that we can start uh, being able to describe things a little bit better to each other and see the bonds broken and forming. We can look at that this activated complex and think that this red bond is starting to form and this carbon nitrogen green bond is starting to break. All right, so this is what the transition state literally is. It's that combination of the two arrows I drew um, to uh, describe the bonds breaking and bonds forming. Now, uh, when we are looking at the activation energy, it's the difference between the energy of the reactants and the actual transition state, okay? So that's the activation energy from reactant up to the tallest peak. Um, the frequency is the number of molecules that begin to form the activated complex in a given period of time, okay? So the frequency factor is going to be very dependent on what the structure actually looks like. So as the reaction begins, the carbon to nitrogen bond weakens enough for the carbon nitrogen triple bond to start to rotate. And so we can start seeing the breakage here and the rotation around um, to the get to the carbon, okay? Uh, the activated complex is a chemical species with partial bonds, all right? And so that's why it's mainly non-isolatable, okay? Going back to the, uh, the Arrhenius equation, just to define that exponential factor, this exponential factor right here, it's e to the power of negative ea over rt. That e is the um, uh, mathematical operation, right? Uh, the exponential factor in the Arrhenius equation is always a number between zero and one, and it represents the fraction of molecules within a sufficient energy, okay? So this will always be between zero and one. Uh, and it is talking about the, the molecules that are sufficient over uh, the energy barrier. The higher the energy barrier, the larger the activation energy, the fewer the molecules will be sufficient uh, with a, a sufficient amount of energy to overcome it, okay? Um, the extra energy comes from the converting the, chem the kinetic energy of motion to the potential energy in the molecule when the molecules actually collide. Remember, if we have to think about um, molecules colliding together, they have to orient themselves in a specific way in order to get these reactions to occur. 
increasing the temperature typically increases the average kinetic energy of the molecules. Therefore, increasing the temperature will increase the number of molecules with a sufficient amount of energy to over uh, come the activation energy, and by default, it will increase the reaction rate based off of this equation. Even if you have a very large activation energy, if you increase T, right, you are going to be increasing the rate of the reaction as well. All right, so the frequency factor is the number of times that a reaction, a re the reactants approach the activation area, uh, activation area barrier per time. Um, the exponential factor factor is the fraction of uh, that approaches of those approaches that are successful. Okay, and so those are the how the two are linked together. Um, the exponential factor is what is affected by temperature. Okay. Arrhenius plots are also able to be done. You can um, algebraically uh, solve this form of the Arrhenius, Arrhenius equation, but again, it's written in a y equals mx plus b kind of way, um, and that is the only change in this, uh, this formula, okay? Um, and so looking at what we previously had, um, the only difference is that we've taken the natural log to reduce that exponential factor to ln's um, and remove it out into the equation so we can uh, plot it on an xy plane. Okay, so again, y ln, okay, x, 1 over t. Slope will be the negative activation energy over r and then the y-intercept, ln of a, the frequency factor. This is the two-point formula. If you only have two data points, um, you will use the following Arrhenius equation, all right? Um, and so you can, you can have uh, at two different points of a reaction, you can use this. Wrapping up collision theory for us. Um, collision theory is talking about um, how do the molecules actually get the reaction going. So the, for a reaction to take place, the reacting molecules must collide with each other. On average, about 10 to the 9, a billion, collisions per second. Once the molecules collide, they may either react together or they may not. Um, and that is dependent on, did they have enough energy to uh, actually reach the activation energy itself? And were they in the proper orientation to form new bonds? Not only do they have to collide and run into each other, they have to run into each other by hitting the correct atoms. Um, and so there's a lot of things affecting the actual rate of the reaction based off of the types of collisions that the molecules are experiencing. I really like this um, diagram, this particulate diagram, because it's looking at all the different types of collisions, right? Um, and how the molecules are moving in a reaction. Um, when two molecules collide, but may not be colliding in the appropriate way, this is where we have uh, no reaction, right? We can see a couple of these um, over the course of um, this particulate diagram. And it's not until we get to this big bright BAM, it looks like it was from the original Batman. Lauren, you're dating yourself here. Um, that is where energetic collisions not only have the appropriate activation energy, but also the correct orientation of the molecules, the atoms that need to collide with each other, the part of the molecule that needs to collide with each other is actually colliding with each other. And it's doing so in such a way that it has enough energy, um, the correct amount of kinetic energy to provide the potential energy to break the bonds, all right? The collision frequency is the number of collisions that happen per second. The more collisions there are per second, the more collisions that can be 
effective and lead to product formation. So the higher the frequency of effective collisions, that really will directly relate to the faster reaction. So we don't just want more collisions, we want more effective collisions. Um, collisions in which these two conditions are met and therefore re, uh, lead to a reaction are the effective collisions. So they have to have the right amount of activation energy and they have to have the right orientation. Um, when two molecules have an effective collision, a temporary high energy, unstable chemical species is formed. And that's what we are calling the transition state or the activated complex. Now, what does orientation mean, Lauren? The proper orientation results when atoms are aligned in such a way that the old bonds can break and the new bonds can form. So if we're thinking about something like HCl plus water, and I'm gonna try to draw the Lewis structures here, and we want to make H3O plus and Cl minus, we need um, a specific setup. We want oxygen to go pick up that hydrogen. So the collision has to be between oxygen and hydrogen that then kicks out the chlorine, okay? So when we make this set of electrons come on the oxygen and make that new bond with the hydrogen, that means that the O and the H have to actually be colliding not the O and the CL, that would be an ineffective collision, all right? It has to be the O and the H. And then this bond can then break and become an extra lone pair on the chlorine. All right. The more complex the reactant molecules, um, the harder they are to collide with the proper orientation. And so those tend to be slower reactions, okay? Um, for most reactions, the orientation factor um, is less than one. And when we're looking at our overall um, orientation factor of A, including, and, and it's incorporated into A for the Arrhenius equation. All right. So again, just to visualize from the textbook, NOCl plus NOCl, two NOCl molecules can collide to form two NO molecules and two Cl2 molecules. But look, we have to actually have them with the effective collisions, right? Cl needs to be able to make that new Cl2 bond, right? And so we can't collide two red guys, can't collide a red guy and a blue guy, we need to collide the two green guys. Those are going to create the effective collision. The more things we add onto these molecules, the harder it is to get that effective collision. And so the reaction itself uh, gets a little slower. <laughs> 